All right, so today we're going to uh, learn how to draw a flow net and then uh, develop a number of equations that uh, will be useful to us on uh, doing some of those seepage and flow of water through soil calculations. So again, we're talking about flow of water through soil. And you recall that the governing differential equation that we developed uh, last time was uh, d2ht dx squared plus d2ht dz squared equals zero, where x and z are the two directions and HT was the total head, uh, proportional to the energy that the water has as it drives through the flow net. So this essentially, the solution to this differential equation gives you H sub T as a function of X and Z. And once you have H sub T, you can calculate a lot of things that are important to us. So let me, uh, uh, and, and the solution to this differential equation, you can do it um, uh, numerically, uh, but you, you can also do it graphically. And the typical solution for um, you know simpler problems is to use a flow net. And so that's what we're going to learn um, today. So a flow net. is a graphical solution to this governing differential equation. Okay, it gives The total head H sub T uh, anywhere in the soil. Now, when we developed this equation, we had to make a number of assumptions, and one of them was that. Um, we, we didn't have the third dimension, you know, everything was plane strain, uh, so that's why we only have X and Z, and perpendicular to the board, everything will be the same. So let me uh, first, we're going to, I'm on page uh, 378, so I go to page 378, and we're going to, um, take an example, and I'm going to write the methodology on how to draw a flow net, the steps, and then we're going to do in parallel the, uh, 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 the, the example. Or, or maybe, let me do the, the um, uh, well, let's see how it goes. All right, number one, make a drawing. A drawing to scale. And to scale, same scale in the vertical direction and uh, the horizontal direction. So let's let's do an example. And I'll, I'll take, uh, let's see, which one is, uh, maybe we'll do the, the spillway example. So uh, it's uh, figure 1313B. So figure 13, 13B. So we have a spillway uh, that looks like this. And like that. And there's a cutoff wall 
At, uh, so this is a big mass of concrete, basically. And then here we have the ground surface, ground surface, and then we're going to have water that is in here behind the spillway, and then water that is down here uh, after the spillway. And if this water goes too high, it falls over the, the spillway. Below, uh, so this is the soil, and then at some depth here, we're going to have an impervious layer. So impervious. You have all this water on this side, a lot more energy than the water on this side, and you can see that the water is going to flow from one side to the other. So that's the drawing two scale. Same scale this way, same scale that way. Otherwise, you will not be able to get back on your feet. Step two, draw boundary flow lines. And you're going to see that there will be uh, two sets of lines in those uh, flow nets. One set will be the flow lines, the other set will be the equipotential lines. So we draw boundary flow lines, and I'm going to put them in red. Boundary flow lines, that means that the entire water flow will take place between those extreme boundary flow lines. So obviously the water cannot go through the concrete here. You can see there will be a boundary flow line that goes down where the molecule of water goes down, takes a sharp corner. Why does it take a sharp corner? Because everybody is pushing that way. And then everybody wants to come up for air on this side, and so that line will go and follow the bottom of the spillway and then come out over here. So that's one boundary flow line. The other boundary flow line is at the bottom of the impervious layer, and then you've got that boundary flow line that where the water molecule is following the bottom of that impervious layer. Everything else, the flow will be between those two boundary flow lines. Draw boundary flow lines. Step three, uh, draw uh, the boundary equipotential lines. So three, draw boundary equipotential lines. So equipotential means that these lines, if you ride on one of those lines, the total head will be constant. So boundary flow lines, I'm going to do them in uh, blue. To do that, we need to find where the first boundary flow line is and when the last boundary flow line is. Now remember, I mean the equipotential line, sorry. So equipotential means same total head. If you consider a point right here, point A, and let's say that we choose the datum zero elevation at the bottom there, the impervious layer, that's uh, convenient. At A, what is the elevation head? Well, it's the elevation of A above the datum. So this will be H E at A. And then at A, what is the potential head? Uh, the pressure head, rather. The pressure head, because you're in the lake here, and no, the water is not moving here, you can do the hydrostatic uh, rule. So then the pressure head here will be H P at A. So total head at A is this plus that. It's this distance right there. That's the total head. 
if I take another point B anywhere on that uh, on the bottom of the lake, you can see that the elevation head will be the same and the pressure head will be the same. So both A and B at any other point on that line will have the same total head. This is an equal potential. So this line right here will be one of the boundary uh, equal potential line. And the total head on that line, anywhere on that line, will be the distance from here to there. Where is the other equipotential line? Well, it turns out to be at the end of the flow net right here. So this is the other equipotential line, because here, uh, this is the elevation head, and this is the pressure head. So now we have the boundary flow lines and the boundary equipotential lines. So I should have an S. Number four, add two or three other flow lines. All right, and that you know it's uh, the, the, as I said, it's a graphical solution. So there's a fair amount of trial and error, okay, because you're trying to satisfy whatever the uh, graphical inferences of this uh, equation are saying or telling us. So I'm going to add uh, maybe two additional uh, flow lines. So one of the <coughs> properties, uh, and there are two properties of flow lines are perpendicular to equipotential lines, or in a set, equipotential lines at right angle. So anytime you're going to have a blue line and a red line, then they have to intersect at right angle. You see here, it's true. Here, this is going back up, and that would be true, uh, and so on. So uh, that's the first thing. Flow lines are perpendicular to a flow line, and then flow fields, we'll see in a minute what it is, flow fields are square. Okay, so we're going to keep that in mind as we draw the flow net, and then it will come uh, clearer as we continue to develop this uh, methodology. So we're going to add, and since the blue line is an equipotential, the red line, an additional flow line, must start perpendicular. So I gotta start this perpendicular, and I gotta go, I'm following the water molecule, if you wish, and it's coming up right here, like that. Then we have to add, we said two or three, we're gonna take two. So I gotta go over here and take another flow line, start perpendicular, then squeeze under the cutoff wall, and then come out way out there. Step five, complete flow net by adding the equipotential lines. And here we've got to take advantage of these two um, properties of the flow net that come from that, what that equation tells us. So I'm going to draw additional uh, equipotential lines and I, I, if, so the, these blue lines, you know, they're going to go something like this as we go through the, the flow net, but again, if I start the first uh, equipotential line, I know I've got to start perpendicular to this because of that first rule over there, and then I've got to make sure that this flow field here is a square. So 
let's say that this goes something like this. And uh, so you say, well, wait a minute, this is not a square. Well, you're right, it's not a square. Uh, it's a square only if you go to very, very detailed flow nets. But so what we do instead, we say, well, uh, that means that you can inscribe, you can inscribe a circle. So right here, I can, you know, it's reasonable to think that I can inscribe a circle. And that's what we mean by square. That's the interpretation. Um, and then I put additional uh, equipotentials. So I've got something like this, and then something like this, something like that, and like this, and like that. And it keeps on going. And so on. Okay, this is not a perfect flow net by far, but uh, then we would have to adjust, adjust flow net. to satisfy rules one and two. So these rules one and two, here is rule one, here is rule two. So for example, uh, you know, is this, um, I could, you know, inscribe a, a circle here. Um, uh, this one uh, is not a good one. I would have to push uh, this uh, blue line over here probably and raise that red line a little bit. So it, it, when you work on those flow nets, it's good. Uh, you know, don't do it in ink. Do it in pencil so you can erase, move, and adjust. And then you look at it and you, you uh, uh, stop when you're fairly satisfied. For example, here, this is not a very good flow feel. Uh, but uh, so again, the red lines, let me put it here, the red lines are flow lines, and the blue lines are equipotentials. equipotential lines. The property of equipotential line, HT, is constant along that line. So that means that if I consider a point uh, right here, I've got a certain value of h sub t. If I consider a point right here, I get the same value of h sub t. If I consider a point right there, I've got the same value of h sub t. And that's going to become quite helpful for the, the rest of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. All right. So now we have, uh, we know how to draw a flow net. We need to talk about the properties, properties of a flow net. So I mentioned already that uh, H sub T constant along equipotential line. Okay. Uh, the loss of total head, so delta H sub T equals loss of total head between two consecutive equipotential line 
And the property is that delta HT is the same for all flow fields. So, if I go from uh, this point to this point, I lose delta HT. If I go from this point to this point, I lose the same delta HT. I burn the same amount of energy uh, for the water to drive from here to there. If I go from uh, here to here, same delta HT. From here to there, same delta HT. So delta HT is, uh, and again, we owe this to the, the drawing of the flow net to satisfy that equation. Delta HT is the same for all flow fields. Rule number three, the flow is the same in all flow channels. Oops. All flow channels. So what's a flow channel? Um, so flow channel is defined between two consecutive flow lines. Uh, so flow channel is defined by two consecutive flow lines. So uh, let me see. I'll uh, I'll put it this way here. This is a flow field. And flow fields vary in size. You can see here you've got a very small flow field. Uh, here is you've got a fairly big one. Here you've got a big one. Uh, so they vary in size. Uh, this right here is a flow channel. So that means that how many flow channels do we have in this uh, flow net? There's one flow channel right here, there's another flow channel right here, and there is another flow channel in here. So the number of flow channels uh, is n sub f equals 3 in this case. We also need to define the number of equipotential drops. So number of equipotential drops. We're going to call that big ND. So we can count that. So I've got one equipotential drop when I go from this blue line to this blue line. So that's one drop, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So in this case, I mean it's not always eleven, but in this case for that flow net, uh, the number of equipotential drops is eleven. The number of flow channels is, is three and the number of equipotential drops is eleven. So these are the properties, and we're going to use those properties to develop <coughs> a number of equations that will help us to solve important problems for uh, spillways, for dams, for uh, excavations, anything where the water is going to start moving because of what we're building. So, properties, now let's generate the equations associated with
with Ronitz. And of course, all this is in the book. Uh, first one. How to find uh, finding H sub T anywhere in the throne. Because that's really what the Fronet is all about. It tells you what H sub T is anywhere in that solid mass. All right. So I'm going to take a random point. Uh, let's say right here. I'll put it in a, a big point here. All right. So this is a random point. Random point M. And the question is, how do I find the um, Total head at n. Well, there's a number of steps, and this may be the most complicated one. Uh, but once you have this, everything else becomes a lot easier. So let's let's concentrate on this. First of all, you have to find the total head at the beginning of the flow net. Okay, so. We, we talked about this, at A you have elevation head, you have pressure head, so this is HT beginning. And then you have to find HTN, and HTN will be this one. Because any point at the end of the flow net here, you know, the water is going this way and coming up this way. So any point on that line, this is an equipotential. The elevation head is here, and the pressure head is here. So that uh, distance, total distance, is the total head at the end of the flow net. Incidentally, you might say, well, wait a minute. What if I choose the datum right here? Or what if I choose the datum right there? That's going to mess up all those values. Yes, they will be different. But you will see that the solutions that we're looking at are based on differences between two levels. And so that's why it doesn't matter whether you pick 0 here, here, or here. You're going to see that what comes in the end is the difference between HT beginning and HTN comes into the, uh, the calculations. All right, so we know that the loss of total head, uh, I'll call it delta capital HT, is equal to HT beginning minus HTN. We also know from the properties of the flow net that the loss of total head is the same through all the flow fields. So if I lose big delta HT when I go from here all the way to there, how much do I lose when I go from here to there through one flow field? Well, I got one, two, three, four, five, and so on. We calculated 11 drops. So when I go, so let's take a you know, water molecule uh, that's starting here somewhere at A. And it's going down and it's taking its time because remember in soils it doesn't go very fast, fortunately. So we can build dams. And so this is the water molecule along that green line. And <clears throat> the loss from this point to that point is little delta HT. And little delta HT is equal to HT beginning minus HTN divided by the total number of drops, capital NB. And the reason again is because the drops, when I go from here to there, I lose delta HT, delta HT, delta HT. They're all the same. That's the property. So now we're able to calculate the loss of total hair 
through one throw field. But what I'm interested in is the total head at M. So again, you're on that dotted green line, and you're driving the water molecule, and you're burning some energy. So when you start here, you have this much energy. And then, when you get to this equipotential, you have burnt little delta HT. So you can say that right here, you're gonna, the energy you have, the, the total head you have, is HT beginners, beginning minus one times little delta HT. And then when you get there, it's the minus two times, minus three times, minus four times, minus five, six, seven, seven point three times little delta HT. So the total head at M is going to be the total head at the beginning of the flow net minus what you burn to go from the beginning to point M. And this is the little nd, that's the number of drops to go from the beginning to M times delta HT or HT beginning uh, minus little nd and then delta HT is given by this so times HT beginning minus HT end divided by capital ND. And so that is how you obtain the uh, expression for the total head at M. HT beginning, you get it here on your diagram to scale. So once you have your diagram to scale, um, you know, you're going to have to measure things on the flow net. So you need a, a, a scale to be able to, to do that at the right scale. So we know HT beginning, it's going to be this. We know N sub D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Point three. I've got to estimate the point three to go from here to there. Seven point three. So little nd is seven point three. Capital nd was eleven, and ht beginning was this, and ht end was that. So now we're able to find ht at m. Let's keep going. Uh, second problem. By the way, you need to know those by heart. Okay. And the, the best way, if you try to blindly remember it by heart, it's, it's a bit uh, difficult. Uh, but, so make sure you understand how you get these numbers or why it's like this. You know, if you understand why an equation is uh, like it is and where it comes from, it's a lot easier to, to remember it. So, second problem, uh, find water stress at M. Again, M is uh, a random point. So, we started by HT at M. And now we're doing what is stress at M. Well, remember that by definition, the water stress at M, U, W, M, is equal to the pressure head at M times gamma W. Well, the question is, what is the pressure head at M? Well, pressure head at M equals total head at M minus elevation head at M. And now, we know the total head at M because we were able to calculate it there. We have to measure from M to the datum to get the elevation head at M. 
So we, we measure here and then that on three meters or so. We now have the elevation head, we know this, therefore we can get the pressure head at M and then multiply by gamma W to be able to get the water pressure. All right, that's very important because then we can get to the effective stress and as you remember, this is a very important stress for us in, in geotechnical engineering. Incidentally, if the question is, uh, if you were to place, uh, you, you drill through the spillway, not a good idea, you don't want to do that. But you drill through the spillway and you place a pipe in here. And the question is, how high would the water rise in this pipe that you connected to point M? Well, the answer is HP at M, because this is the, the, the definition of HP. Now, uh, you know, if you, if you try to guess where it is, well, M is between this level and that level. Okay, so it's not going to rise here, it's not going to rise there. It's probably going to rise somewhere in between. But the point is that this distance right here would be HP at M. This is really getting to be a mess. So I hope you can still see it. But this is HP at M, and then this is HE at M. And so therefore, this whole thing is the total head at M. And when we have some problems with dams, rarely, but sometimes, we do put some standpipes, we'll call them piezometers, and so that we can check if the pressure is too high or, or, uh, uh, or too low or, or what's going on. We're trying to understand if we, if we have some problems, uh, uh, what what is going on? All right, so that's second one. Three. What is three? Three is um, the hydraulic gradient. Okay, find the hydraulic gradient. Now why is it important? Well, you remember the, uh, our discussion last time about uh, quicksand condition. And quicksand condition was associated with upward flow of the water fast enough that it can cancel gravity. And then the soil grains don't push against each other. You have zero effective stress and you have a heavy liquid, but you have no bearing capacity. So, Flow goes down, flow goes across, flow comes up. This is where we have to be careful because here the water is going up and it's going to try to overcome gravity if uh, the velocity is high enough and the hydraulic gradient associated with that. Then we have to make sure that here we're going to put a factor of safety against what could happen. All right, so find the hydraulic gradient. Well. The hydraulic gradient, by definition, is equal to the loss of total head, so uh, delta HT from A to B, divided by the drainage length from A to B. And there is one uh, hydraulic gradient that is particularly important to us, and it's called the exit gradient. So the exit gradient, I exit, is the is I for the smallest flow field on the exit phase. of the flow line. So the smallest flow field on the exit, here is the exit phase. Smallest flow field is this one. So we would calculate what is the uh, hydraulic gradient 
in that particular location for this particular flow field. How do we do that? Well, delta HT through this flow field, we have it right here. So we know what delta HT because it's the same in all the flow fields. So it's uh, in particular true for this one. So we know delta HT, and then we got to measure with the uh, the ruler with the scale the length of that flow field. And then we can divide the two and we can find what this exit gradient is. And then, you remember we, de we developed something called the critical gradient. And the critical gradient was gamma saturated minus gamma W over gamma W. And I said, you know, gamma saturated is around 20, gamma W is around 10, 20 minus 10 divided by 10, this is about 1. And then we put a factor of safety on the, the uh, I critical to make sure that this exit gradient is not too high that we get ourselves in trouble. So we'll write that I exit must be less than I critical divided by a factor of safety. And uh, considering the uncertainties associated with these calculations, we usually take four or so for this uh, factor of safety. So we put a real uh, serious factor of safety against uh, that condition. Next. Now we need to be able to calculate, so incidentally, um, let's say that I give you a choice, we're doing a race now, okay, I give you a choice, and you have the choice between uh, uh, writing the water molecule at A or writing the water molecule at B. And the the question first is, will the water molecules come out on the other side at the same time? You know that the velocity, we didn't write it, but V equals Ki. Remember that? That was Darcy's law. So V equals Ki. So when you're writing that molecule, your speedometer says V. Well, actually it doesn't because it's... Anyway, it's an indication of the velocity of uh, that uh, molecule. Uh, so, the velocity is proportional to I. And you know that I is delta HT over L, where L is the distance uh, that you the water is driving through. You know that delta HT is the same throughout the entire and any of the flow fields. So really the velocity is dictated by the length of the flow field. And it's a lot longer here than it is here. So you should ride molecule B if you want to win the race. All right, so the length of, now, again, V equals Ki, and I is delta HT over L. Delta HT is constant, L varies with the size of the flow field. So right here, right here, you have a small flow field, L is small, delta HT is the same, I is one of the highest values. Right here, you have a very small flow field. And so your I value is high, the velocity is high, and that makes sense, you know. Everybody wants to go, it's like a highway problem. Everybody wants to go and it becomes much narrower, and so you gotta step on the gas, or the person behind you is gonna push you. So high velocity, low velocity, uh, low velocity, high velocity. Now, why do we not worry too much about this? Because here the flow is horizontal. 
And so that's not going to overcome gravity. But when the flow is up, then we have to worry about this uh, quick condition. All right, next problem. The next one will be uh, the flow, the amount of flow that will uh, go through. And you remember that was the other one, so we write that Q equals VA. So flow, uh, this was 3, 4. So 4, flow through or under uh, uh, let's just write it flow through the soil I was going to say the dam but it's a, this is not limited to dam problems flow through the soil so again we're going to use Q equal VA and V equals KI because these are the two things, and we're going to use the properties of the um, uh, of the flow net. So I'm going to call little q little q is flow through one flow field. Okay, so any flow field, I'm going to call that Q. Because uh, you don't know that these flow lines here are like the lanes uh, line on the highway. But because we have laminar flow, nobody is crossing the line. So you're driving on the highway and you're not allowed to change lane. So any water molecule that goes in here has to follow that flow channel and come on the other side. Nobody crosses that, uh, that uh, red flow line. Now, if you get into turbulent flow, now you know, everybody's crossing. This is a, you know, a traffic mess. Uh, but laminar flow, everybody stays in their lane. And so that means that the flow through one flow field is also the flow through one flow flow channel. Okay. What is that value? Q is equal to K by A. K, what is I? Well, I is delta HT divided by L. And you say, well, uh, what's, what delta HT is it? Well, it doesn't matter, they're the same everywhere. So delta HT divided by L times A. Well, A is the area perpendicular to the flow. So, uh, if I take uh, this, this one, for example, A is going to be that distance that I will call little d times 1, because we're going to take a unit perpendicular to the board. So times d times 1. But remember the rule that for the flow net, because of the flow net, L is equal to D. The length this way, which is L, is equal to D because we had to be able to inscribe a circle or the flow field was supposed to be a square. So L is equal to D and therefore um, Q is equal to K delta HT because D is equal to L, so that cancels, all right? Now, this is Q in one flow channel. So the big Q is going to be little Q times the number of flow channel, which is capital N sub F. Okay, so 
this is equal to k n sub f delta ht. And delta ht is ht beginning minus ht end divided by number of drops, n sub d. Okay? So that's the equation for the flow. And I'll, uh, I'll stop here. And then next time we will, uh, we will practice all those equations uh, by running through some problems. Okay, so I'll see you next time.